do. So Doug's question uh, to kick us off here is some job postings offer remote work to start then eventually present at work. Uh, so what would you recommend into leveraging that to mostly remote when we return to normalcy like I leveraged work at home? Uh, yeah, so I think that's that, you know, we have uh, positions right now that are remote work. And then once this pandemic is over or once COVID is over, uh, you know, over wh whatever that means, um, once we get to sort of normalcy or whatever the new norm is, uh, we'll have to see where we stand. Now, what that's probably going to mean is that we're going to be uh, more likely in office, at least more than we are today. So I think in order to leverage yourself to be out of office fully, you're going to have to start by doing an amazing job today. So those employers are looking for someone to long-term be in office. But if you can come into a new job today and prove that you can get a job done fully remote and knock it out of the park, that is going to be the number one way to prove yourself and then ask for more remote work in the future. Um, so that's definitely key. Uh, there are some tactics you can employ uh, when you're talking about leveraging more work from home. I'll say the number one tactic you can employ is a lot of companies give a one year raise. And what I like to do is during that first year um, or any year for that matter, uh, but especially during that first year, if you are interested in working more from home and they've got you in the office more than you would like to be, then negotiate with work from home time. Uh, a lot of companies are price sensitive. So if they were going to give you, uh, say, a 3% or a 5% raise this year, you could even say, hey, guys, I don't want to raise this year. Pay me exactly the same as you're paying me today. But I would like to work from home on Fridays uh, or I would like to work from home two or three days a week. So those are definitely some things you can do uh, to try to use leverage. A lot of people think of the only thing you can negotiate with at a job is money, but that's not true. You can leverage for work from home time. And I would also sort of going into a different topic, I would also recommend working for less than 40 hours. So that is a huge tactic that I've applied is when they're getting ready to give you that annual raise um, or a bonus or whatever it is, if you can trade money for time, I would go for that. And that means working from home or even saying, hey, is it okay if I'm done at four o'clock every day instead of five o'clock? Um, so those are some of those things that you can put into place that a lot of people don't think about. But if you're working for especially small to mid-sized companies, they're a lot more price sensitive and willing to work with you uh, if you're willing to save them a little bit of money. So I hope that helps, Doug. All right, let's see. So, and I think to piggyback on that, you said that some jobs are in other states. You know, there's a little bit of a play here. Um, yes, and definitely time in exchange for money. There's a little bit of a play here given the pandemic, and I'm not saying take advantage of the pandemic, but what I am saying is now is a reasonable time to apply for jobs that are not necessarily local to you. This is a definite win if you want to apply for a job and you're actually willing to move to that location post COVID. Now, the other thing is, you might be able to, you know, some companies are talking about not going back into office until January 2021. Now could be a great time to apply for a company, work fully remote, even though that may be across the country from you, and work fully remote for six to eight months right here. And then if they call you back into office and you can't negotiate to be fully remote at that point and you're not willing to move to the location, then you would have to go your separate ways. Again, don't take advantage of the pandemic but this could be a great way to get six to eight months experience right up front, fully remote. All right, so the next question I see here, uh, anywhere someone could find test scenarios to work on real world issues beyond Salesforce trails, I learned best by doing. All right, thanks for that question, Daniel. Uh, yeah, so if you're looking for actual real world hands-on experience, my number one recommendation here is volunteer opportunities. Now, clearly, if you don't have your Salesforce administration uh, certification or maybe even a couple of other certifications, it could be difficult to even get volunteer opportunities, but that doesn't mean give up. The number one way to get real world experience is to do volunteer efforts. Uh, we have videos on this on the YouTube channel, but uh, check out volunteermatch.com and taproot.com. It might be volunteermatch.org, so don't quote me on that. But if you Google volunteer match, uh, you'll definitely find it. 
this sets you up with volunteer companies in your area uh, that are looking for uh, Salesforce help, uh, but maybe they don't have the funds to do uh, to hire someone for what the rates are, you know, $75 for a beginner contractor up to, you know, $200 for an expert contractor an hour, and they just don't have the funds to support that. So definitely look into volunteer opportunities. If you don't see them on volunteer match, that doesn't mean give up. That means you need to look for people who are potentially hiring for Salesforce administrators and reach out to them and say, hey, I know you've got a job posting right now, uh, but I would be willing to come in and do some volunteer efforts for uh, say two weeks or four weeks. And if you like me, you can hire me. And if you don't like me, then you got some free volunteer work out of me and we can go our separate ways. So uh, make sure that you're going to companies, pitching to them. A lot of companies don't post volunteer work because they simply don't know it's available. They don't realize there are people out here who might wanna get some experience by doing volunteer work. So they don't bother to post because they don't realize that market is out there. So reaching out to other companies, make sure you're part of your local Salesforce community. Uh, you will find they're doing virtual meetups right now, but they'll do local meetups once uh, we're post pandemic. And if you can get involved in some of those communities and network with the people within those, most everyone who's part of your local Salesforce community works as a Salesforce professional at a local company, and you may be able to get some volunteer work from there, or better yet, you might even be able to get an internship or a job. All right, let's see. So uh, we have a question here um, from Sultan. Are certifications important to get an interview for Salesforce? Developer or trailhead modules are enough to get an interview call? Um, yeah, so the short answer there is yes, you're going to want to get a Salesforce certification in order to be taken seriously uh, for a full-time Salesforce position or even contract work or consulting work you're going to need a Salesforce certification. This is the one uh, sort of go-to way that employers know that you're good at what you're talking about, that you know what you're talking about, um, and you're able to come in and do the work. Now they're still gonna interview you, they're still gonna press you. If they're a good company with an interview process, they're not gonna trust that certification, but it is definitely your foot in the door to get an interview. And if you have the first, you know, admin certification, that's great. If you can get the platform app builder and then maybe even the sales or service cloud certifications, those are great level up certifications to separate you from the pack. Now, the other thing we always talk about, uh, you know, super badges are huge. Um, if you can get a few super badges, make sure to put those on your resume, make sure those are landing on your LinkedIn page. Uh, those are another great way. So if, if they've got a Salesforce admin certification, applicant who's got two super badges, that looks okay. If they've got a Salesforce admin certification that's got 15 super badges, that guy looks really good. So you can separate yourself with the use of super badges uh, a little bit. So uh, certifications are key, experience is key, super badges are definitely part of the formula if you're looking for that little tweak of uh, extra appeal that you can give to an employer. All right, so I see, let's see. So we can talk, uh, if you have any questions, make sure to post them. Uh, otherwise, I'm just gonna jump into some uh, typical topics that are questions. So uh, most of you guys on here are likely already very familiar with Trailhead. Now, a big question that we get, I'll talk about Trailhead a little bit, but a big question we get is, where else can I go instead of Trailhead? Um, so Trailhead is number one. If you haven't set up your Trailhead account, uh, we've got a YouTube video on that. Make sure you check out that video. Set up your Trailhead account. That is the number one thing. That is the number one place to prepare for your Salesforce certification. That is the, that is the place where you'll actually uh, check to make sure, you're, sure your certifications are up to date and you're registered. That's where you're gonna get your super badges and that's where uh, potential employers are gonna come look at your profile to see what you've got in the form of trailhead training. Now, if you're looking for other ways to study, if you're looking to practice specifically for the exam, check out Focus on Force. They have great practice exams uh, that you can get into and sort of get a feel for the test. Now, just because you pass a practice exam on Focus on Force does not mean you're ready for the Salesforce certification exam, but it does give you an indication of how prepared you are. My advice is try to get an 80 uh, or higher on your Salesforce certification, uh, 
your focus on force practice exam. And once you're consistently getting an 80 or higher on those, then you should probably consider going ahead and uh, sitting for the Salesforce certification exam. Uh, I just saw a question pop in and we'll touch on this really quickly. Uh, how do you set up your Trailhead account? So if you go to our channel page, uh, we have a video on how to set up your Trailhead account. Uh, bottom line is that one will walk you through every little piece, uh, but you should just be able to Google Trailhead and you'll see really quickly how to log in and set up an account. Um, so if you pop over to our video, you can see it there. Otherwise, just Google Trailhead and it'll take you right to it. All right. Um, so, oh, thanks, Ram. I appreciate it. Uh, so the other thing is, where else can I get other study materials? Maybe I'm burnt out on Trailhead or maybe things aren't clicking for me. Um, I will tell you that I have not personally used Mike Wheeler's content. I've heard some good things. I've heard some not so good things. But it sounds like it is a very common path to take. Uh, if you're looking for a little bit different style training, uh, but still going through the trailhead accounts and still learning material. So those are a great place to start uh, if you're interested. Now, the other thing is a trailhead boot camp. And I believe still right now through the end of July, they are running a trailhead boot camp uh, for, I believe it's $199, might be $200, I can't remember, but uh, 200 US dollars um, for the trailhead boot camp. Now, again, check out the Facebook group. Uh, there are some people who say it moves too fast. I can't follow it. But there are some other people who swear by it and say this is the one-stop shop to get your certification in 30 days. So if you're looking to get your certification fast and you want to give Trailhead Bootcamp a shot, uh, basically their motto is we can move you through the certification process, get you ready uh, to pass that certification test, and that's all through the Trailhead Bootcamp, and that comes with an exam voucher. So if you were going to pay full price for an exam voucher anyway, it's basically a free training and a free path to the Salesforce certification exam. All right, so let's take a look here. We've got how to select a trail mix for administrator certification and trailhead. Uh, you're an admin beginner, intermediate, uh, and prepare for administrator is enough. Yes. So what I would do, uh, Rupa, if I'm in your shoes, what I'm going to do is uh, check out the video where we had the uh, how to set up your trailhead account. You're going to see, I don't remember the exact name of that trail, but it's something like preparing for your Salesforce administrator certification. That is the uh, module that you want to go through to prepare for your Salesforce administrator exam. Now, when you get to the end of that module, don't just go... Uh, take the take the exam right away. Um, what you want to do is hop over to Focus on Force. They offer a free practice exam for the Salesforce certification exam. And you can go ahead and hop over there and you can sort of see where you stand. If you make, say, a 60 or 70 on the Focus on Force practice exam, you might want to do a little more studying before you actually go sit for the Salesforce admin exam. However, if you make an 80 or higher, I would say, on the Focus on Force exam, that likely means you're ready to go ahead and sit for the Salesforce certification. Also, if you don't know, uh, thanks for posting that, Sultan. Uh, so 199 for the Trailhead Bootcamp right now. Uh, so that's a great value if you're ready to focus in and dive in on the information. Uh, if you're not sure you're ready to really focus and spend the time on training to get your certification, maybe don't do the Bootcamp right now. But when you're ready to dive in and take 30 days and get this thing done, Trailhead Bootcamp is for you. Now, uh, also note, if you have not uh, completed a superset in Trailhead yet, and you have not uh, gotten your first certification, you can go ahead and sign up for your Trailhead account. We've got a link, uh, another video. They're giving away free vouchers right now. Um, that has not expired yet. They did say it's for a limited time, uh, but they didn't give us an expiration date on that. So if you have not completed a superset in Trailhead and you have not uh, gotten any certifications up to this point, hop over to that video, click on the link. That's going to take you to sign up to get your free Salesforce exam voucher. You do have to do some training in Trailhead, but that'll just prepare you for the test. So if you're totally new, you haven't signed up for Trailhead, no superset, no certifications, hop over there to that video and you will be able to get your uh, free voucher uh, as long as supplies last, according to Salesforce. All right. So a question from Ram. So Thanks for posting the Mason Frank salary info. Based on your experience and research, do you feel those salary ranges are accurate? 
specifically asking about admins and consultants. All right, guys. So if you saw the pay expectations video that we did, um, again, just to point out, those are not numbers that we came up with, which means that's a great question from Ram on whether or not we agree with those numbers. So those numbers come from Mason Frank International, which is a huge recruiting company. Uh, and specifically, they do a lot of recruiting for Salesforce professionals. Well, every year, uh, Salesforce hosts a conference called Dreamforce in San Francisco. And there are thousands of people who come out for this conference. So that is the time when Mason Frank does a survey on Salesforce salary expectations for different roles. So in that video, you may look at some of those numbers and say, hey, those numbers sound a little high. Like, I think it had junior administrators making like 90, maybe even 100,000 USD uh, for a junior administrator. So I'm going to come right out and tell you, I don't know what they labeled a junior administrator as, but you, unless you live on the West Coast in a Silicon Valley city, uh, in San Francisco, maybe in Seattle, uh, places like that, you're not going to see $100,000 for your first job. So I think they must have considered a junior administrator to be someone uh, maybe with two or more years experience, but maybe not five years experience or something like that. But it definitely was not a beginner um, from my experience, I'll say. So what I would expect is coming out of the gates, no experience in Salesforce, you've got a certification, your starting salary should probably be within the fifty-five dollars to $65,000 range uh, for your first job. Now, the nice thing about Salesforce is how quickly you ramp up with pay. So when you're looking at, uh, if, you, if you make $80,000 today and you hear that starting salaries for Salesforce are only $60,000, that shouldn't deter you. Because from my experience, your first year, you'll get paid about 60 grand. Your second year, uh, you will make about $80,000. And then your third year, you will be tagging right up against six figures. But everything after three years experience, you're going to make $100,000 or more. If you move into consulting, you're going to make well over $100,000. Um, and if you start doing private contracting, it just depends on how many hours you work. But you can expect to charge about $100 to $150 an hour for private contracting. Um, and so clearly from there, if you charge $100 an hour and you get 40 hours a week of work, that's $200,000 a year. So you can see how that works. Even if you only got 30 hours a week of work, you're still at $150,000 a year when you're billing $100 an hour. So uh, those are just some base level numbers. Again, to reiterate, if you're a beginner, you're going to make about $60,000 a year for your first position. Um, and it only goes up from there. You can expect to max out at around $200,000. Um, no matter how much experience you have, unless you are super specialized um, or maybe you're managing a team of Salesforce experts or something like that. All right, so uh, we see going in order here, I have another question. What are the roles and responsibilities of a Salesforce administrator or a consultant? So uh, I'll keep referring that we do have a video on what to expect when becoming a Salesforce consultant. Um, so being a consultant is uh, fundamentally different from being uh, an administrator. And the, the main difference there is that when you are a consultant, you are working for likely three to five different clients at a time, uh, totally different projects. You could be sitting there with uh, internally at your company, you may have a team of three people. And those three people may be totally different depending on which project you're on. So you could be on a project with uh, a developer and a project manager on your first project, and then a totally different developer and project manager on your second project. Same thing for the third project. So in a consulting world, you could be working internally on three projects with six different people. Um, so that can make things a little bit stressful, but if you're ready for a challenge, consulting can definitely give you that challenge. If you're ready to level up your career, the number one way to level up your career, if you have a year or two experience um, or anything more than that, go ahead and jump into consulting if you're ready for a challenge and you're ready to really level up your Salesforce experience. Now, if you're an in-house administrator, that's much easier. So that's a, what we refer to as a W-2 position. Uh, you're a full-time employee with benefits. Uh, I should also note that there's a little confusion with consulting. Consultants also are employees with benefits at a consulting company, um, but they work on multiple projects with multiple clients. 
with the W-2 position, you're just working for your employer. So there's a lot less stress. It's much easier uh, to navigate the waters if you need to, you know, you said you'd be done by Friday and then you realize it's going to take a few extra days. No big deal. You can talk to your manager. You can talk to your coworkers. Let them know you hit a snag and you need a little more time. No problem. You can move on from there. In consulting, it's not quite the same. Those guys are paying about $200 an hour to your consulting company for your time. They expect you to deliver a, uh, a professional end result solution in Salesforce, and they expect you to, to deliver it on time. Uh, so they're not going to, if you, I mean, you can always go over, uh, you may, you may need to extend because of a, something that happens on the project, but just know that there's a little bit more intensity when you're talking about being a consultant. And that's why those guys get paid quite a bit more, uh, to be consultants. All right. So Mark asks, when you consult with a client, do you follow the Salesforce pro bono PDF guide or something else? Okay, so the Salesforce pro bono guide, uh, you will have seen that if you watched our volunteer work um, video, uh, we have a link to the pro bono guide. That is strictly for volunteer work. Um, and the reason for that is because some of the stipulations within that pro bono PDF are that you wanna limit how much time you spend on a project. Uh, you wanna make sure you stay within scope because you're doing free work and you need to set expectations for I'm not going to work for you forever for free and I'm not going to do everything you need me to do. And it's not always going to be done right away because this is free volunteer work. Now, when you're talking about moving into uh, actual paid work, you don't really want to limit the scope too much. Um, you definitely want to get paid for every hour you work, but if they ask you for more work, you're going to say, yeah, absolutely. I want to do more work. Here's how many more hours it's going to take me, and here's your bill for those additional hours. So when you're talking about uh, being a consultant, the guide is very different. You want to continually be uh, trying to find ways to get a little more work. Um, you don't want to recommend things they don't need, but if you see, if you're doing a volunteer project and you saw a need for, say, 10 more hours worth of work that would really help them, you're not necessarily going to volunteer to do 10 more hours of work. But if you're in a paid situation with a client, you are absolutely going to recommend something to them for 10 more hours of work. So that's sort of the difference. Um, when you're in a paid environment, you're going to want to recommend to do more work. You're definitely going to uh, be tighter with your timelines and you're going to lean more on the client, uh, what they need. So if they ask you for something, the answer is always going to be yes, unless it's, you know, absolutely ridiculous. Um, whereas with volunteer work, you want to make sure you're keeping track of your time, uh, and being reasonable with how much you're volunteering to do, because a lot of times you're volunteering when you already have a full-time job. Uh, so you're only available within certain hours, or, uh, you may only have five or 10 hours a week to volunteer. So you can't get everything done by Friday. Um, so those are some of the differences there. All right. So in my experience, uh, thanks for the question, Mark. All right, so Catherine, in your experience, what are the chances of landing a part-time Salesforce position? Is that even an option for the admin position? All right, so yes, you can land a part-time position. For your first job, probably not. That doesn't mean it's out the window. It just means uh, it's more difficult because you haven't proven yourself yet. If it's your first job, you've got your certification and you wanna go into a part-time role as your first job, it's going to be a little difficult because you've got to show them that you're ready. Now, if you have a year or two experience and you want to move into a part-time job, this is what my recommendation would be. Uh, if you have experience, find a, uh, find a small company because small companies are much tighter on budgets. So you can come in and say, hey, I see you've got a job posting here that pays $80,000 a year. I would like to work part-time and get paid $50,000 a year, but I will get the entire job done. For a small company with a tight budget, saving $30,000 a year is huge. That might enable them to do more marketing than they had expected to. It might enable them to hire another employee uh, that they hadn't expected to be able to hire. So the next question is gonna be, well, how on earth are you going to do a full-time job in half the time? The cool thing is, most full-time employees and anybody out there who is a full-time employee, you can attest to this. Uh, unless you're super, <laughs> like super on top of it, chances are mm -hmm. you're coming into the office at eight or eight thirty. 
then you're probably sitting down chatting with a couple of coworkers, getting some coffee, getting some water, and you might be sitting at your desk focused in by 8.45. So 45 minutes of the day just went out the window. Let's call it nine o'clock to make it simple. You're sitting down at nine o'clock working. Now you go take lunch at 12 and you're gone until one o'clock. Um, and then you're coming back into the office, the same thing. You're having a couple of quick conversations. You're sitting back down, hopefully by 1.30. At some point in the day, you're probably checking personal emails. You're probably checking your text messages. You're, you know, taking maybe longer bathroom breaks than you uh, would have, had to go grab something from the car, whatever it is. Chances are you are highly inefficient in your full-time job and everybody else is too. That's not a stab at anybody. Everybody's inefficient. You're doing, you know, workplace chatter and then five o'clock comes Chances are, if you finish up a task at 4.30, you're not going to start something new. So when I go to talk to an employer about potentially working part-time, and, and I say, hey, you've got a job posting for $80,000, I want to do it part-time for $50,000, but I'm going to get the job done. And they say, how are you going to do that? And I say, I'm not going to take those breaks. I'm going to show up at 8 o'clock, coffee and water ready, and I'm going to sit down and get the job done. I'm not gonna do anything else. I'm gonna focus in and I'm gonna knock this out by lunchtime and then I'm done for the day. Now, of course you say, if there's a fire, I will always have my phone on me, give me a call. I can help if there's an emergency. And then slowly you'll be able to dictate what emergencies are and you can work with management to make sure they're only calling you uh, for true emergencies. So that's some of my quick advice around if you're looking for a part-time role, um, look for companies that are already hiring for a full-time role and then give them the part-time pitch, um, which if you're good at what you do, you really can get the job done in half the time. Now, the other thing is if they're not quite ready to take a stab um, or to take a shot on you, uh, what I like to do is offer up a two week contract and say, hey, I'll work for you for two weeks at 20 hours a week. If I get the job done and you love me, then hire me full time. If I don't get the job done and this doesn't work out, no big deal. Just go back to interviewing applicants and find your full-time person. But I can get this done at almost half the price and half the time, and you can go spend that money somewhere else. All right, so thanks for that question, Catherine. All right, so Sultan, does COVID-19 have impact on hiring Salesforce professionals? Um, so I'm not going to sugarcoat this. COVID-19 has an impact on hiring in just about any uh, professional job market. Um, it has nothing to do with the fact that Salesforce professionals are still in high demand. They are highly needed. Companies are, you know, bleeding to get a Salesforce professional who actually knows what they're doing. So it has nothing to do with demand. COVID has taken a toll on internal processes for companies, and they are apprehensive about hiring right now. So don't get me wrong. Yes, absolutely. There are less companies hiring. They're trying to uh, squeeze a few dollars back and hold those tight in case things get worse. They're just not sure what's going to happen next. So a lot of companies are trying to get by with what they have right now, but they are definitely still going to interview um, and prepare to hire. So uh, get ready when we get on the backside of COVID um, and we get sort of post pandemic. Uh, I think you're going to see the floodgates open up and a lot of hiring happening fast um, in the next few months, assuming that, you know, we don't have a second wave with COVID or anything like that. All right, so Ram asks, is it unrealistic become, to become a Salesforce consultant after earning your admin certification and having six month experience as a W2 creating reports and dashboards? Yeah, um, if you're going to go into consulting, the interview process is a little more uh, intense. So people are gonna be asking uh, for you to complete uh, test projects. They're gonna want you to explain those projects. Uh, they might even want you to do like a, uh, a mock uh, interview with a client where you're talking to a client about a project. So uh, if you don't have real experience, you're going to uh, really fail at the consulting interview. Um, so you want to really know your stuff. I would say typically you're going to be in a W-2 environment for at least a year, um, probably right at a year. And you're going to uh, be in a position where you're working uh, in a more dynamic environment. So if you're just creating reports and dashboards, activating users, deactivating users, um, you're not going to be dynamic enough. So you need to make sure you're utilizing all aspects of sales cloud, maybe some aspects of service cloud, uh, recommending third-party tools like DocuSign, 
uh, or power dialers or uh, like Conga Composer, like document generation tools. Like you want the company to use a lot of third-party applications. You want the company to use a lot of different aspects of Salesforce. Uh, that way you're dynamic, you're versatile, and you're experienced and you can move into the consulting world actually knowing quite a bit about Salesforce and some of the other capabilities that it has. All right, so let's see here. I'm gonna go down. Next question here we have is, when looking for your first job, is it better to go with a new org that you build yourself or try to get into an org that is already set up? Um, so good question, Fritz, and thanks for joining, Fritz. Um, we, I, I would say on your first job, uh, it's probably not going to be up to you, but if you are lucky enough to have an option where you have one company that's interviewing you and it's a brand new implementation, and then you have maybe a second company that's interviewing you and they're looking to do updates to an existing org or maybe their admin left and they're looking to bring on a new admin uh, and you have an option there, I would say I, I'm torn. Um, as a beginner, uh, a new implementation is probably where I would lean to because it gives you a way to really get some unique experience of taking an org that has no custom fields, no custom reports, uh, no updated page layouts. You're going through every single step of the process. And from an experience standpoint, you're setting up roles, profiles, new users, you're giving them access, uh, resetting passwords, all the simple things. And you're probably even gonna be on the hook for training them on Salesforce and how to use it. Um, so I would be gung ho on getting into a brand new, fresh implementation for an employer uh, because the experience there is incredible. Now, coming into a existing org, there are a lot of what ifs. What if they had two or three Salesforce administrators within the last couple of years that were building all kind of things left and right, and they really junked up the org. Um, you could have a ton of automations that aren't working correctly. You could have validation rules in place that aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing and they're firing off errors. You could have duplicate data, dirty data, um, users who aren't using the system correctly. So to answer your question, if I'm a brand new administrator, I like a brand new org or at least a simplified org um, that hasn't had too much damage done to it yet. Um, however, there's a lot of experience to be gained either way. When you're cleaning up a big mess, that's also a great way to come out on the other side with a ton of experience um, and being very dynamic and problem solving. So uh, either way, you're gonna get great experience, but probably the easiest way to uh, ease into the Salesforce ecosystem would be a new implementation. Uh, thanks for that, Fritz. All right, so Ram says, can you talk about your experience with Salesforce from the time you first started uh, to the level I'm at now? Are there things you wish you knew that you, uh, that you know now? Uh, yeah, the, there are things that I wish I knew. Um, I'll say number one, uh, I think something that is overlooked is passion. And a lot of people talk about passion, um, and this is an easy one to check off your list, okay? So even if you're a beginner, uh, even if you don't even have your first job yet, one thing you can do to differentiate yourself, yourself is show how passionate you are. How do you show how passionate you are? Uh, do something simple start a blog for free and just blog about your experience. Um, start a YouTube channel like this and just do a few quick videos about how you're going through your trailhead account and things like that. The important part is not to be successful. You don't need thousands of subscribers. You don't need views or likes or readers. You don't need any of that. When you go into an interview and the company says, why should we hire you over the next guy? You want to be able to say, because I'm passionate about this, I've self-trained on Trailhead. I got my certification with no guidance, no instructors. I did this thing by myself. And then you can come in and say, I write my own Salesforce blog. I have my own Salesforce YouTube channel. If there's a question of whether or not I am in this thing for the long, the long haul, I'm your guy because I love Salesforce and I'm not gonna be burnt out on this a year from now. Um, so if you can find ways to show passion, that is a great way to do that. Other ways, make sure your LinkedIn profile is up to date. Do the things you're doing today. Be part of Facebook groups like learning Salesforce and building your talent stack. Get involved in those Facebook groups. That is a great way to show potential employers that, hey, I'm not just another guy looking to take your money and sit at a desk and do the least amount possible. I'm the guy ready to 
have you pay me, but for me to also come in, dominate this job, and I can show you how much Salesforce means to me because I'm involved in the local community. I'm involved in Facebook groups, LinkedIn groups, um, and I even you know do some stuff on the side because I'm passionate about Salesforce. So that would be my number one thing. Um, now, talking about from the time I first started my Salesforce career to where I am today, um, other things I wish I had known. When you are a year or two into your first job, you're going to think you know everything. Um, after you're probably three or four years into the Salesforce ecosystem, you're going to realize you will never know everything. Um, it's changing too quickly. So don't get ahead of yourself uh, when you're sitting with clients and they say, uh, can you do this? And you say no. And they say, are you sure you can't do this? You better be sure because the Salesforce ecosystem changes so rapidly that things you couldn't do yesterday, you can do it today. And things that were very difficult yesterday are really easy today. So um, just be mindful of that and know that you can be really good and you can be an expert Salesforce professional. That does not mean you have the answer to every question. And it is okay to say, I don't know, but I will find out for you today and you will have an answer by the end of the day. That is an acceptable and respectable answer. Um, so yeah, so that's to talk about my experience and where I'm at today. Um, again, today, I don't know everything. I have people who reach out to me and they ask for uh, development help, um, programming help. And I have no uh, issue with saying, I don't know how to code. I'm not a programmer. I'm not a Salesforce developer. I am a Salesforce administrator. And you can also call that a solution architect in the consulting world. And I can tell you right away, you don't need to be a developer to find lucrative pay in the Salesforce environment. You can take any role you want. If you want to be a CPQ specialist, if you just want to be an administrator, if you want to be a developer, you want to be a marketing cloud or part of expert, you can do all those things. And that doesn't mean you're going to take a pay cut. Now, don't get me wrong. Salesforce technical architects are going to get paid 200,000. The Salesforce administrator is going to get paid, say, 120,000 at an expert level, maybe 150,000 at an expert level. Um, if you're like me and you have a respect for money, $150,000 a year is great money. Don't get me wrong. $200,000 a year is even better, but none of that is a bad income and none of that uh, should be considered something that, you know, you should have done something different and you should regret it. Really every outcome in the Salesforce ecosystem uh, is a good outcome in my opinion. All right, so is there any chance to get hands on a live project on YouTube or other websites? Um, so getting hands on on a live project, again, I'll just circle back. Um, you're gonna wanna go to Volunteer Match uh, and check out what their opportunities are. Network in your local community, network on LinkedIn and the Facebook groups. Try to find companies that may not have volunteer opportunities posted on Volunteer Match and get involved with them. Um, like personally, sometimes I have people reach out to me and say, hey, I could help you with a project. Um, and, and that's great, but, it, and, and I do appreciate people reaching out. And I also think um, that the type of person who thinks to reach out to me and ask me if I can help them, uh, if they can help me with a project for free, that's the type of go-getter attitude that you need to get out there and get those volunteer opportunities. So just because someone's not asking doesn't mean you shouldn't be asking them. If you see people that are working for companies and they already have jobs, go to them and say, hey, could I do some volunteer work for your company? Is there somewhere I could fit in? Even just doing simple stuff like cleaning up some reports or whatever it takes to build my resume, go ask. I personally, um, it's, it's too much of a time suck for me to try to fit in uh, working with someone. And I personally already have an intern working for me. Uh, so I don't need the extra help, but there are companies out there where they are sitting at a desk from eight to five o'clock every single day and they could use someone to come in and help them. Uh, so again, have that go-getter attitude. If you're sitting here going, oh, I don't have a job, it's the pandemic's fault. If you're not messaging people, if you're not hammering people and going and getting the positions, then you're not doing everything you can yet. All right, uh, so let's see here. Another question, Sultan says, do recruiters consider badges, points, and super badges along with the certification? So let me grab some water real quick and I'll answer that. All right, so as far as badges and points go, 
um, recruiters aren't too concerned with how many badges and points you have. And the main reason for that is because you can go grind badges and points. Um, you can just go through and click the answer A, 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 save. Okay, which ones did I get wrong? B, 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 save. Um, and you can do that over and over to grind through badges and grind through points um, without really knowing what you're doing. So the badges and points don't give you a lot. Now the super badges, yes. Uh, I definitely recommend putting the super badges on your resume and LinkedIn profile. They're not nearly what a Salesforce certification is, uh, but they are some added impact when you're looking at making that one little differentiator to change the way an employer views you. The super badges can definitely make a difference. All right, so speaking, uh, Daniel asked, uh, so number one, thanks Sultan for all the questions. I appreciate uh, you keeping the ball rolling here and keeping solid questions on the table for us. All right, so another question from Daniel. Uh, speaking of volunteer work, are these orgs actually pretty used to freshers popping in to learn? Uh, if you are not familiar with the term freshers, that is basically a beginner or a junior level uh, Salesforce resource. So thanks for the question, Daniel. Um, are they used to it? I will honestly say, uh, yes, they are used to freshers coming and looking for work. However, um, a lot of times the companies that are looking for volunteer work, sometimes they've worked uh, with volunteers before. Other times this is their first time working with a volunteer, so they don't know what to expect. What you can expect is to be interviewed um, and to need to do a good job on that interview. Otherwise, they're not just going to let anyone rogue uh, come into that org and start making changes uh, because you can mess things up. Just because they're uh, looking for a volunteer opportunity, maybe they're not the biggest company in the world, uh, typically nonprofits, that, that doesn't mean they're not operating a real company and a real business that's meaningful to them and to their clients um, or donors or whoever it is. So yeah, they're going to evaluate you and they want you to be good. They're not expecting you to be top notch. They're not going to expect you to be amazing. They are going to expect you to be uh, sort of respectful, responsible, and ready to take on their environment. Um, so I would say if anything, when you're coming into those roles, make sure that you're letting them know, hey, I'm not the kind of person who's gonna go in and make changes like crazy. I will always check with you before I make changes. Um, and even let them know that you're aware of what a Salesforce sandbox is, and you'll test your changes in a sandbox before you put those in production. Uh, I would say the number one thing with volunteer opportunities is they're gonna be a little weary about free work, and you need to make them feel confident that you're not gonna come in and destroy their org. Um, so, so that would be my advice there. All right, so Ram, can you give an example of common consulting projects that you've come across? Uh, yeah, recently, uh, within the last couple of years here, uh, you may be familiar with uh, Salesforce, it used to be on the classic interface, and that was the only interface we had. Now there's the Lightning interface, and I'll say companies are torn. There are a lot of companies on Lightning now, um, and there are a lot of companies still on classic. There are also a lot of companies sitting in the middle where some people are using Lightning and some people are still using classic. Um, so one of the biggest projects or the most popular projects we've seen recently are companies converting from Classic to Lightning. And what that means is they need people to come in, make the changes to get them over to the Lightning interface and basically train their users on how to use the Lightning interface because it's a brand new user interface for a lot of people. And for most companies coming over from Classic, they've been using Classic for years. And now this is a big change for their sales, their support, their marketing department and all of their management teams so they're looking for people to come in and convert them over to Lightning, show them how to use it, make them comfortable in the new interface. Um, that's a great example of a common project. Now, other things, uh, you'll have brand new companies that are implementing Salesforce. Uh, so they bought Salesforce from a Salesforce employee, a salesperson at Salesforce, and now uh, they need to implement the tool and get it set up. So that's where you come in, you talk to them about, hey, what information uh, do you need to capture about a lead in order to qualify them? And there's always going to be something different. We need to make sure they're ready to spend at least $5,000. We need to make sure that they're uh, within, you know, this age for the product that we're selling or that their business does things like this for the product that we're selling. So you're making sure they're a good fit for your product before you qualify them. Um, and you're talking them through how do you qualify a lead? How do you report on how many leads were qualified and converted and all these kind of things. So um, it can be very basic. A lot of companies are looking for something like uh, setting up DocuSign, like an e-signature tool. A lot of companies are looking for people to help them with their 
uh, hey, we just bought Pardot. Can you help um, make Salesforce and Pardot uh, talk to each other so that everything works smoothly? So you might work on some integrations. You might work on some implementations. Um, it's really everything you can imagine is what goes on in the Salesforce uh, consulting environment with clients. Um, a lot of people, that makes them scared or a little skittish. Uh, but if you're ready for a challenge, Salesforce is always going to keep you on your toes. Your clients are always going to have these new and interesting requests. And it's a really cool way to uh, come up with solutions and help them grow their company, be more efficient, be more productive. And the really cool thing about Salesforce is that a lot of the time you're this magician on the back end that's doing all these magic things. And everybody is so thankful uh, when you get things done and make their work life that much easier. All right, so uh, thanks for chiming in again here, Catherine. So aside from going through an actual interview, do you have any recommendations on where to prepare for that? Obviously you wanna research the company, but outside of the obvious. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna grab another sip of water here and then I'll jump in on that. All right, so to your point, one of the number one things to do is to research the company. That's clear, right? But for a lot of people, that's not obvious. And what does it mean to research a company? So here's what it means. When you're coming into a company and you've landed an interview, the last thing you wanna do is walk into that interview and not understand what that company does, okay? So if you're going to apply uh, for any company, say it's a local company to you, and you know that they're a manufacturing company that manufactures air filters, just an example. And you come in there and all you know is that they manufacture air filters and you want a job. That's not good enough. That's not differentiating you. You need to come in there having, uh, what I would recommend is going on their website, maybe filling out a couple of forms um, and seeing what happens next. Because what's gonna happen is you could say, hey, I'm a potential client and I'm gonna fill out these forms and you start getting some of their emails um, and you start maybe getting a couple of their sales calls to, to evaluate you. And what you can start doing is documenting their process before you go in for, to the interview. And you can, uh, and it is amazing. If you can show up for an interview, a huge difference maker when you go into that interview is if they say, hey, Brad, uh, you know, do you think you could help us with this process? What do you think makes you better um, than anyone else? And you can come in and say, well, I mean, the first thing I noticed was that I filled out uh, the form on your website and it took a salesperson three days to give me a call. Obviously, you guys know that timing is everything. And if I'm on your website filling out a contact us page and you don't call me for three days, you may have just lost me as a customer. So we need to number one, work on maybe some alerts that go out to your salespeople when a new form fill out happens. Um, maybe we automatically send a push mobile notification to their phone. Maybe we uh, do some reporting to make sure people aren't falling through the cracks. Can you imagine if you showed up to an interview and they asked you a question and you were able to tell them what they're doing today and some recommendations you have that you can improve on their process right now and you're sitting in the interview, you are going to blow them out of the water. You might separate yourself from somebody with, uh, you may have no experience and you're coming into your first job and they may have just ended an interview with a guy with two or three years experience and three certifications. But the fact is, if you come in and you say, hey, I'm passionate, I'm part of the local community, I'm part of these Facebook groups, I've got my own blog and I already know your business process before I even walked in the door because I have registered online and figured out what you were doing and I think I can help, you could put yourself above even the most experienced uh, consultant because you're someone who is focused, you have passion, and you have motivation to get this thing done. And that's what people are looking for. All right, so uh, Doug C, question. Uh, thanks, Doug. So I think you mentioned in Facebook that you've implemented a K-12 org. Can you tell us how similar different that is compared to a traditional business org? Uh, good question, Doug. I have not done the K through 12 org yet. I've got it on the sort of on the bench right now. Uh, so COVID wiped that project off my plate because uh, all of the schools, um, so it was actually for a private school system and they ended up wiping that project uh, or putting it on hold because clearly they were putting a lot more effort into 
uh, dealing with doing uh, distance learning for the students and things like that. So we have that one on the docket for uh, the fall and I will definitely keep you posted. Um, so as far as K through 12 goes, I only know what I've researched. Um, what I will say though, is that uh, all these different org types like uh, K-12 um, and these nonprofit sales packs and things like that, those are really just layered on top of Salesforce. The platform Salesforce is still, uh, the groundwork is still there, like the, the leads, accounts, contacts, opportunities. Um, the reporting is all exactly the same. The page layouts, uh, how to create fields, um, all that stuff is exactly the same. So I would say if you are experienced in an org that is not a nonprofit or not a K-12, uh, you are going to be able to transition to a different type of org uh, with really, don't get me wrong, you're going to have to research and you're going to have to get good at it, um, but you're going you're gonna to come in with a baseline that is very much prepared uh, to transition into another org. All right, so we've got a question here uh, from Jason. He says, how would you answer what your salary expectation question? Uh, YouTube says, don't give a range, okay? And I understand entry level varies from 50 to 60K. How would you answer that question? Um, that is a really good question, Jason. Uh, and that is a really tough question to be asked. Oh, it's, um, yeah, so I, I think I think my answer to that question, and this is a personal response, uh, I guess I would call it a recommendation. This is what I would do. Figure out what your answer is to that question before you go into the interview. Do not show up to an interview not knowing what your, your salary expectation is because that is very likely a question you're going to get. Somebody's gonna say, especially if the interview goes well, they might hit you with, hey, Brad, great interview. We loved having you in here. We think you're a great fit. How much are you expecting us to pay you? Whew. Now, if you don't have an answer for that question, you're gonna be in a tight spot and chances are you're going to say a number lower than what you really want because you wanna land the job. And then you're gonna get in the car to drive home and you're gonna realize, whoops, I really needed to make a little bit more than that and I didn't ask for what I wanted. Um, now, here's my advice. Ask for what you want. Ask for a couple thousand dollars more than what you want. If you see salary expectations online for beginners are 50 to $60,000, um, ask for $60,000, honestly. Um, if you wanna get paid 65,000, ask for 65. They're gonna negotiate with you unless you say, I wanna make $100,000 and they're probably not gonna call you back. But if you say, I wanna make 65, but you're willing to accept 60, they and they were willing to pay 60, then if you say 65, they're likely gonna say, hey, I like where your head's at, we like you, I know you said 65, I think you're worth 65, but we've got 60 in the budget right now and you can talk to them about, hey, if I get a couple more certifications or uh, if I prove value to your org and I can show tangible results, uh, can we reevaluate in six months to a year? And you can have those discussions. But the number one thing is know what your number is. Uh, I would recommend for a beginner, uh, start at $60,000. Uh, also go ahead and go to Glassdoor. So Glassdoor is a website where you can look at salaries for companies. And if it's a bigger company, a lot of times you can search them on Glassdoor find someone who is in the Salesforce area and figure out what their salary was just by searching on Glassdoor um, and figuring out where, what, their, what their range is there. Another thing is look at the market they're in. If they're in a market and they're making tons of money and the company's expanding, uh, that's another part of researching the business. It's If you go into a company and you look at a news article and they say they just laid off five people two months ago, they're probably not in a good financial place and they're not ready to hear a big number. Um, so think about that when you go into it. Now, if you read a news article about them and it says, or even went to their Facebook page and they said, hey, we're celebrating uh, our 100,000th customer and this is our first million dollar month or whatever it is, then hey, they're probably doing okay. And you might be able to ask for a little bit more because they're in a better headspace to hear a higher number. So those are a few ways you can think about it, but it's a personal question and the question is, how much um, are you looking to make? And uh, I'll put a personal spin on this. People don't care how much you need to make. Nobody cares about your bills. Nobody cares about your finances and how much debt you're in. Um, nobody cares how long you've been unemployed and all those little things. They're not gonna pay you $100,000 a year because you need $100,000 a year. None of that matters. All that matters is what the market price is, where that company is today, and how much they're willing to pay 
for this particular position. So I hope that doesn't come off too uh, sort of crass, but just keep your personal finances out of what you're asking employers to pay you. All right, so gonna hop down here. So uh, thanks again, Jason. So Daniel says, that is awesome advice. Never thought of that, filling out the forms. Thanks for that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, make sure you move through uh, anytime you're doing research on, on companies. Um, keep in mind, you are a key player in helping strategize the process for that company and what they're doing. Um, so anytime you can help them improve their process, speed up their sales process, speed up their marketing process, uh, speed up their qualification process, help them see how much money they're making, all that stuff, the faster they can move through those processes, the quicker they can get in contact with their customers, the quicker they can make a sale, the quicker they can show results. Um, so anything you can do to learn about that company and then spin that into improving the company. Now, you don't want to come in looking like the guy who knows everything. So don't come in saying, hey, I think your company really stinks at this and you really need to improve this because that was garbage. That type of talk is not going to get you anywhere. You need to come in and say, it needs to be uh, building for them. So if you can come in and say, hey, I filled out that form on your website, or hey, I gave you a call on your contact us number, um, and I didn't get a call back, but I left you a voicemail. Um, so we definitely need to make an improvement there. Maybe we can talk about uh, a CTI tool to guide those calls right into somebody's inbox. Uh, make sure it shows up in their email, make sure it shows up in Salesforce. Um, make sure you are responding to your potential customers. So. A lot of ways to differentiate yourself in, in that way. All right, let's see here. All right, Ram says, how many consulting contracts or hours are too much to handle in your experience? I value money and value family time. All right, so that's a good question. That's another personal question. Um, I will give you a personal answer because I'm an individual and I'm not going to give you these uh, sort of businessy answers. So uh, I personally have a three-year-old daughter and a wife that I want to spend as much time as I can with. Um, but I also want to spend time helping other people in the Salesforce community. And I also have a job. Um, so many of you know that I have a part-time job. And that is because uh, Salesforce has provided me a way to make way more money than I ever expected to. Um, I wanted to be a high school teacher when I was in college. And I probably would have made $50,000 a year um, at this point in my career. And now I'm making, you know, $170,000 a year working part time. And for that reason, um, you know, I could go out and probably make $250,000 a year or more uh, if I were to work more hours. But it's about how you value spending your time. I value spending time with my family, with my daughter. Um, so I've made some life choices that say, hey, I don't need a new car all the time. I don't need the biggest house all the time. Um, I don't need to go out to eat all the time. And I've been able to make choices to keep my expenses low so that when my salary kept jumping up, I can make those decisions to say, you know what? I don't want to make more money. I prefer to work part time, make a little bit less money and spend time doing the things I value. So if you want a personal recommendation, keep your expenses low um, as you get these huge hikes and your Salesforce pay. And the less time you're working and the more time you're uh, doing the things you actually want to be doing, the happier I think you're probably going to be. Now, if you're the, that, and that is different, that is totally different for different people. Some people think 40 hours a week is a nice work life. If you're coming from a world where you're working 80, 100 hours a week, and you can get into a world where you're working 40 hours a week, some people, that is a dream. And 40 hours a week, that's great. They want to do that. Some people are very comfortable working 60 hours a week because they have this mentality where they always want to be working. Maybe they don't have kids yet. Maybe they're very career oriented. Maybe they're the only working person and they have three or four kids and a wife who's at home with the children or a husband who's at home with the children. So they may be much more career oriented um, and need to bring home the money and want to save and put away. Now, if you're like that and you want to work 60 hours a week, you can do that. So it's a very personal choice. For me, I'm on the bottom end of that spectrum. 20 to 25 hours a week of work for me is more than enough. Um, if I had to work 40 hours a week, I would be burnt out and feeling like I didn't have enough time to do the things that were more valuable to me. Um, but of course, whatever you need to do to pay the bills and put food on the table for the family uh, is definitely key to determining how much you're going to work. 
All right, so uh, Ram also asked, uh, and, and thanks for that, Ram. Uh, is it possible to take on contracts while working a W-2 admin job? Does it depend on companies non-compete? Very good question. Uh, is it possible to take on contracts while working a W-2? Absolutely. Um, a W-2 job, I don't think you're going to see a non-compete with a W-2 job. The exception is if you're working at a consulting company. If you work for a consulting company, there's a gray area there. Um, but uh, for the most part, as long as you're not contracting on the side with clients of the company, you should be okay. If you're stealing their clients, obviously that's not okay. So just make sure you're not you know, pushing any buttons there. If you're not sure, ask your manager. Um, but if you're in a W-2 job for a company down the street uh, and you're doing contracting, you know, say you work for, what was our example earlier, uh, uh, air filter manufacturing company, say you work for them, there is no issue um, with you going and doing some consulting work and, uh, you know, for a company that sells cars or a company that sells software, there's no competition there. There's no uh, issue. Now, obviously, they want to make sure that you're still getting your job done and your side contracts don't take away from your job. But as long as you're getting your job done, absolutely take on other jobs. Uh, for my entire career, I've had... Uh, my main job, which is like my W-2, I've got my 401k retirement accounts through that, um, I've got my healthcare through that, and then on the side of that, I'll do side gigs here and there for uh, clients that I enjoy working with. Uh, so yeah, absolutely, you can, uh, that's what's so awesome about Salesforce is the flexibility um, where you can work a W-2 job, do contracts on the side, you can choose to just do contracts, you can choose to just be a consultant, um, you could choose to work one client five hours a week, and that'd be the only thing you do because you make enough money doing that. That is what's so awesome about Salesforce. You can work five or 10 hours a week. You can work 60 hours a week. It's all about how much money you want to make. Um, so let's take a look here. Uh, yeah, Jason. Um, yeah, I would say, uh, yeah, $170,000 a year working part-time. I've done that for the last three years. Um, and I would say I average about 20 hours a week, um, sometimes more, sometimes less. Uh, that is what the YouTube channel is all about. Um, that is what I'm trying to empower everyone else to do. A lot of people look at me and they go, you're a special case. That's BS. No one can achieve that. Um, it's not BS. I'm trying to help people get there. Uh, it does take some creativity. Um, it does take time. You're not going to make $170,000 working part-time next year. Um, but you can make $170,000 working part-time three years from now, five years from now. But the best thing you can do is get started today and knock it out. Um, if you guys want to know how I do that and how that's structured, I am happy to share. Um, <clears throat> but the bottom line is I have a part-time job, um, fully remote, uh, where I'm on the clock for them about 15 hours a week. Um, if I get my job done early, I might be able to get some things done for uh, some of my contract work on the side. Um, and it's just a matter of balancing um, my W-2 job that is part-time with the contracts I have going on the side um, and getting enough work done to generate those levels of income. Um, also, I have nine years experience right now, which may not sound like a lot um, to someone who's had a job for 30 years, um, but to someone just starting nine years is a big difference and how quickly you can get work done, how efficient you are. Um, we're going to be dropping a video here in the next couple of weeks on how to become a more efficient Salesforce professional. And we're gonna talk about some of these little tweaks and changes you can make to get the same thing somebody's getting done in eight hours, you can get it done in like two or three hours. So we're gonna talk about some of those tips and tricks uh, where you can do a $100,000 job in half the time. So now you can have two jobs paying $100,000 and get all of that done in a week's work. So we're gonna talk about how to navigate those waters and how to get that stuff done. All right, so what to expect in a technical interview for a Salesforce administrator? Yeah, uh, for your first job, it should be pretty straightforward. They're going to be asking you, they may ask you to complete a project, but you'll be able to take it home and work on it and ask communities like the Salesforce Facebook group that we have, um, what do I do here? How do I work on this? Um, so there's room to navigate that. Uh, in an interview, definitely expect people to say things like, what's the best way to alert the team 
when a new lead has come in from our contact us form and we're currently uh, currently it's a weekend, but we want to get this notification because it's a hot lead or something like that. Um, and the short answer might be, well, you're going to want to uh, web the lead form to be your form online. You're going to want to have criteria to tell you uh, how you differentiate a hot lead from a normal lead. And then we're going to want to put a process builder with an email alert in place or even a push notification to a mobile device in place to push those alerts out to um, the individuals who need to get them. So I need a list of the people that need it. I need to know what criteria it is about that lead that makes it a hot lead. And we need to have your web to lead form set up. If that's your answer to that question, you just nailed it. Um, so just make sure you're, it's all the stuff you're studying on Trailhead. Make sure you're familiar with the different solutions to different problems. Um, don't be afraid to say, uh, hey, let me think about that for a second and then come back with an answer. But of course, if you can hit the nail on the head right away, um, or if you can give a couple of different solutions that make sense for a, a single problem, you're gonna look uh, you're gonna look great. And also make sure to mention that um, this is the answer I would give you right now to a question. Uh, but in the real world environment, if you hit me with that requirement, I would do some research on the trail trailhead community pages. I would do some research in the uh, Salesforce local groups, and I would make sure to not only get a good answer but the best answer for that problem. So hopefully that helps. All right, Jason says, uh, not a question. He just wants to stress the importance of volunteer work. Since I added volunteer work on my resume, I've had two interviews and three lined up for next week. One of them is second round. That is awesome, Jason. Um, yeah, so number one, congratulations. Uh, everyone should be applauding that. And that should speak to this process. And I'll say with a lot of things, it is trust the process. COVID and this pandemic have thrown a wrench into hiring right now. There are a lot of companies with hiring freezes. There are a lot of companies who may not necessarily be on a hiring freeze, but they're just waiting a minute to see how things pan out, make sure the business is stable, and then bringing, uh, bringing on a new resource. So right now people are sort of you know, tightening the purse strings a little bit and they want to see how things go. Um, but Jason, that is an absolute testament to, we can be in the middle of a pandemic and you can have no Salesforce experience at a job, but because you've done volunteer work, you have differentiated yourself. And if you can use a few of these tips, you can right now in the middle of a global pandemic, potentially, you know, it looks like you've got five interviews lined up. You can line up interviews and get jobs right now and probably the worst time to get a job in the last 10 years. So I think that speaks volumes to what is possible and don't make excuses, don't let excuses get you down. If today didn't go well, tomorrow's right around the corner and you can knock this thing out. So don't get down on yourself, don't give up on the process. These things do work. Salesforce is in high demand. Spend every day applying for jobs, differentiating yourself, researching the companies that you're getting interviews with um, and making sure that you're studying, getting certifications, getting volunteer work, be prepared for your opportunity. All right, so I know we are over our hour here, so we're at an hour and 15 minutes. Um, this has been huge for, uh, for me. I love doing these live broadcasts. Um, I'm just gonna do them once a month. We're gonna hit this again next month. Uh, I don't wanna do it more than that because I feel like I might get burnt out. You guys might get burnt out on always having a live Q&A. We're going to do these once a month, especially right now with COVID going on. Things are changing month by month. Um, and so the, the Salesforce world could be a different world a month from now. I might have a little bit different advice a month from now. Um, so just stay tuned. We're going to hit this again in a month. If you are not a member of the Facebook group we have, um, make sure to join the Facebook group. That's where um, I'm trying to ask interesting, insightful questions. I'm posting uh, content as quickly as I can about how to get better training, how to get free exam vouchers. Uh, what do you need to do next in your career to level up? Um, a lot of people are out there asking amazing questions. We have really amazing members. Um, we do not allow spam in the group. If you see spam, it is gone in 10 minutes. Uh, no one's advertising or selling you anything. Uh, you're never gonna see anybody ask you for a penny. Uh, and if they do, we're gonna block them. So make sure you get on the Facebook page. Awesome environment uh, to enable yourself and enjoy this journey. 
Uh, the name of the Facebook group is Learning Salesforce and Building Your Talent Stack. Uh, if you're watching this video, you're on the channel right now. So if you pop over to any of our other videos, you'll see the link to the Facebook group in the video description, um, and you'll be able to hop right over from there. Uh, make sure you answer the questions. Uh, I will very quickly decline people if they don't answer the questions because it just shows a lack of uh, sort of motivation to actually join the group. So if you want to join the group, make sure you answer the questions. I'll get you right in and you can hop into that world. Um, make sure you join your local Salesforce communities. Let me see. Uh, yeah, so join us on the Facebook group. Um, if you are getting value from the live Q&As, if you're getting value from our other content, uh, please subscribe, please watch our videos. Um, that's the best way to show us love. Uh, we don't get paid anything, nothing's monetized. It just helps us get the message out in front of more people. Um, so we're, we're not doing this for our benefit, we're doing it for you um, and other people out there, especially people struggling with the pandemic right now. Um, unemployment, hopefully temporarily, is at an all time high. Um, so we wanna give people a way to level up their skills, add a new skill to their talent stack, get better at Salesforce, make themselves more marketable um, and get that out there. Uh, so yeah, if you if you don't mind and you like what you're seeing, subscribe to the videos. Um, we are gonna post the new event for the live Q&A for next month here about in the next week. Um, so you can actually click the reminder button on the live Q&A session whenever it goes up and it will remind you to come over to YouTube and check that out. Um, if anybody has any last minute questions, feel free to ask. I'll hang on for a couple of minutes here and make sure that we get everyone's questions answered. If you realize you had a question and you wanna check it out, um, and you want to get that question answered, ask it in the Facebook group. I'm living over there too. I'll get your questions answered. Um, we will have this live Q&A posted live. Uh, we'll, we'll have to put that up probably tomorrow at some point because we'll make some adjustments to it and get it live. Um, but we will have a recording of this session. If you want to share it with friends, family, um, please do that. We want to share the message and get the word out to as many people as possible um, so that they can level up their careers and find meaningful work. All right, so I don't see any more questions coming in, so I think we will go ahead and wrap up here. Um, again, I'll, I'll hang on for just a couple of minutes, so if anybody has any last minute questions, I'll get those answered. Um, but if not, thanks for watching. We'll see you in the Facebook group, and we'll see you next month for the live Q&A. Thanks, guys.